Monsoons impact billions of people in South and Southeast Asia, the Maritime Continent, and Northern Australia annually. These large-scale rain events are responsible for much of the annual precipitation that occurs in many locations in the region. Essentially, the monsoon is the off-equatorial migration of the intertropical convergent zone on the nearby land masses. This module will discuss some of the basics of the South Asian Australian monsoon. Shown here again is satellite-derived mean annual precipitation for Earth. It is maximum over the Indo-Pacific warm pool, where it is enhanced by warm sea surface temperatures and numerous topographical features. The black ellipse highlights the region where most of the monsoon rainfall occurs. Not all of the rainfall is associated with monsoons, but much of the rainfall over the continental land mass in the tropics is. Note in contrast how dry the region north of the Himalayas is. Dry air, which is not supportive of the deep convection that develops during an active monsoon, is present there. The Himalayas act as a barrier against that dry air reaching lower elevations south of the range. Typical onset dates of the summer monsoon are illustrated here. Generally speaking, the onset date is earliest near the equator and a broad but not contiguous area of precipitation progresses northward across India. First onset of the monsoon over most of India is climatologically in early to late June. Monsoon onset starts early over topographic features in Southeast Asia and progresses toward the Northeast into China later into the summer. The fundamental forcing for the monsoon is the temperature contrast between the ocean and the land, much like we discussed for easterly waves that develop in the West African monsoon. The temperature difference drives a pressure gradient driven flow toward the land Although rotational effects and the western Somali jet are also important components of the mean monsoon flow as we will see shortly. Anticyclonic flow develops over land in the upper troposphere where the pressure gradient force is oriented generally from the land toward the ocean. Prior to onset, the land mass can become very hot, setting up a strong pressure gradient. After monsoon onset, the temperature gradient weakens as the ocean remains the same temperature, but the land becomes cooler after rains began and shortwave surface insulation is reduced. However, diabatic heating, both radiative and latent, above the surface, help to reinforce the thermally direct component of the monsoon circulation after its onset. The heaviest precipitation falls over eastern India and surrounding countries, including essentially all area immediately south of the Himalayas where my mouse is right now. This can ex these Himalayas can extend up to over 8,000 meters high. That's where Mount Everest and other high topography is located. However, locally enhanced precipitation is also observed where low-level westerlies encounter topography. This happens in the locations circled in black. Over these terrain features and to their west, the monsoon circulation can modulate rainfall as mesoscale convective systems form near the topography and move westward. A feature that we saw earlier in the course is also diurnally dependent. An active monsoon can be reliably identified based on the magnitude of the upper troposphere temperature anomaly. During the summer monsoon, 200 to 500 millibar temperature is greatest over the northern Indian subcontinent is seen by the shaded region, which indicates where climatological mean temperatures are warmer than those at the same level over the equator. During boreal winter, on the right here, the highest temperatures are located over the maritime continent. Therefore, the winter monsoon has essentially an opposite sign structure in terms of circulation and rainfall. It would be dry over the Southeast Asian continent and moist over the maritime continent. The mean low-level flow of the South Asian summer monsoon is shown here. Numerous features are present. First of all, note that the circulation is not simply a thermally direct circulation extending from the ocean to the warmer landmass. It's much more complicated than that. Importantly, the flow is influenced by the westerly Somali jet, which is governed largely by terrain in East Africa and is uh, the northern branch of cross-equatorial flow from the southern Indian Ocean. It is a major supply of moisture for the monsoon convection over South Asia. 
the curvature of the cross equatorial flow seen down here is expected for a steady state flow in quasi-geostrophic balance with a negative meridional pressure gradient present. Recall that we can only assert geostrophic balance on the largest scales in the tropics, but this is approximately applicable at these scales. In the absence of rotation, such as at the equator, the PGF is balanced by friction. Vortices are also found upstream of terrain features. Here's one, one, and another. Such as to the west of the Western Ghats and the Arabian Sea, in the Bay of Bengal, or the South China Sea. The location of the largest rainfall totals are shaded in gray and extend across eastern India, Bangladesh, Nepal, and Myanmar essentially south of the Himalayas. The red line indicates the approximate location of the monsoon trough. This is a region of enhanced relative vorticity and can lead to the development of tropical cyclones in the locations that we mentioned earlier. And also further out off the picture in the West Pacific. The monsoon trough is not fixed in space and its extension into the West Pacific can enhance low-level westerlies to the south of the trough axis, which enhances wind-driven surface fluxes there and can be further favorable for deep convection. An example of convection in the monsoon seen in visible imagery is shown here. Plenty of convection is active across South India and the Bay of Bengal, as well as Southeast Asia. Here's India right here, and the Bay of Bengal. The trajectory of the flow is also apparent in the cloud field, denoted by the red lines roughly. This is reminiscent of the previous schematic of low-level flow in the summer monsoon. Locally, as we mentioned, convection may be modulated near small topographical features impinged upon by the mean westerly low-level flow. The schematic shows an example of how rainfall along the western Ghats, along the western coast of the Indian Peninsula, sensitive to the strength of the Somali jet. During strong winds, shown at the bottom, convection is strongly forced over the topography near the coast. However, dry air intrusions over the Arabian Sea prevent convection from forming offshore and remains relatively shallow. During periods of weaker westerlies, the convection is not as strongly forced over the land. However, convection is then more likely to occur offshore. Monsoon depressions are common in the Bay of Bengal and generally form along monsoon troughs. After developing, they tend to move toward the north and the west and are additional features that contribute to heavy rainfall in Bangladesh and eastern India. Lines in this figure follow the tracks of monsoon depressions from the Bay of Bengal toward the west and brighter colors denote deeper, stronger depressions. The exact mechanisms responsible for their northwestward motion are as of yet unclear. During boreal winter, the monsoon circulation reverses as the landmass over Asia becomes relatively cold relative to the tropics and northern Australia. The curved flow across the equator is again expected as Coriolis goes to zero. Topographically induced gyres may form in the South China Sea and tropical cyclogenesis is also possible in regions of enhanced vorticity near northern Australia. During the winter, the ITCZ shifts southward over the equator and rainfall is more focused over the maritime continent, including northern Australia. See the video linked at the bottom of this slide to watch a three to four minute long NASA video showing various satellite data during the summer and winter Asian Australian monsoons. Monsoon activity is also subject to intraseasonal variability with time scales of 20 to 100 days. Intraseasonal oscillations are discussed with more detail in a different lecture series. However, intraseasonal variability can be separated into eight phases that follow the cycle of rainfall over the 20 to 100 day period. This figure shows anomalies of outgoing long wave radiation during the eight phases during boreal winter on the left and boreal summer on the right. 
If we focus on phase two to start, we see blue colors over the Indian Ocean during both the winter and the summer. During winter, the blue area, which represents enhanced convection, therefore negative OLR anomalies, propagates along the equator and toward the east in later phases, impacting the maritime continent in northern Australia. This is associated with the Madden-Julian oscillation. During boreal summer, the blue area tends to propagate more toward the northeast, as we can see going into later phases, eventually extending zonally from South Asia to the West Pacific, impacting Southeast Asia as well, and maybe northern parts of the maritime continent. This variability is known as the boreal summer intraseasonal oscillation. This pattern of enhanced and suppressed rainfall may be superimposed onto the background monsoon circulation, causing spatial temporal variability in the precipitation observed during the monsoon.